All right. It is noon on Wednesday, so thank you for joining us today with What's New This Week at One Schoolhouse. I'm going to start the closed captioning for those of you who would like to see that. And actually, I'm going to do that after we get going here for a little bit. Um, welcome. And I have two guests with me today who are internal to One Schoolhouse, but we're really going to be talking about what's going on in the action out at schools, because both of you I know are talking to schools all day, every day. So we're talking about partnering for problem solving today. So on our blog right now, Sienna will drop in the chat. We've got a post on how to solve scheduling problems with asynchronous learning. And I think that this is the time of year as we get into the conversation, we'll be talking about different kinds of challenges academic leaders are facing. So we will get started on that. Uh, next week's webinar, we're going to talk about managing the unexpected during the busiest time of year with someone who has deep expertise in doing that and has some time with doing that. So, oops. Then, as because we have Liz with us here today, I'm going to ask her to share a little bit about this, but this is the time of year where we are asking folks, hey, if you've got a need, um, classes are starting to fill up. So Liz, can you talk a little bit about the status of courses at One School House? Sure. So we are on track for another record setting year at One School House um, in terms of our student courses and enrollment. Um, and so this is the time of year, and I'll talk probably more a little bit about this later as my guess. Um, where schools reach out to us to help solve very specific problems. So kids who want two singleton sections that meet at the same time, um, students um, who need to be off campus, whether they're at a semester program or um, increasingly these days, because there may be health concerns or students who um, have immunocompromised family members, um, or you know, late breaking staffing challenges. So we get those calls daily here, and we work with schools to help figure out if um, our student courses can help them make sure that their on-campus students get the academic experience that they're looking for for this school year. Great, thank you. And I'm gonna call out the abstract, not the spoiler for the webinar, because we're gonna dive into each one of those. I have a lot, lots of questions for you. Um, so every week we take a pulse of academic leaders and we ask a question and then I always share the preliminary results, but it's not too late. If you didn't click on the pulse link, the, the survey is still live. And before we send the results out on Sunday, we'd love your input if you haven't had a chance to participate. So this week's question, what challenges are really important to your students and families right now? So what are school leaders hearing from families? And you know, we're not having the start of school that we were anticipating at the end of, in May, we looked at August and September with real hope and optimism. And I don't want us, I think Brian Stevenson says, you know, absolutely never give up hope. That is so important. But there's some discouraging news here. You know, we're having intense conversations on campus about vaccines and masks and safety protocols, and those are definitely going to keep going for a while. So that's, that's what's on academic leaders' minds. So having said that, that with that being on your mind, we're going to talk a little bit about ways and strategies of um, making some other challenges more manageable for academic leaders. So just again, I'm Sarah Hanewald. I'm the assistant head of school here at One Schoolhouse. And with me are um, two of my colleagues, Beta Eaton, who is our director of student support, and Liz Cates, who is our director of school support, assistant head of school for school support. So both of you, do you mind before we dive right in, just demystify for everybody a little bit about what you do here at One Schoolhouse. So Beta, how about you first? Sure. So uh, as the director of student support, I am very much in the thick of things when students are enrolled in our courses. And that actually means I am liaison between multiple stakeholders, including our schools, our students, um, parents and guardians at certain points, and, and also our teachers. Um, and so I 
for the most part, try to help solve problems within the school year itself. Uh, that being said, though, um, Liz and I work very closely together as we are beginning school and getting our, our schools enrolled and, and helping support schools who really need um, some help problem solving. Great. Thank you so much. Liz, tell us a little bit about you. So um, I'm just um, finishing up my fourth year here at One Schoolhouse, and I joined the team working in school and student support um, and then transitioned into this role a little more than a year ago. So um, in school partnerships, my job is to help make sure that the 200 and close to 250 schools in our consortium are getting the resources and the support they need. So this time of year, that means student courses. At other times, it means professional development. Sometimes it means making sure that we have the resources available on their website. Um, what I love about my job is that I get to talk to schools all across the country every day. Um, and uh, you know, after 20 years in independent schools, the thing that I love the most is um, getting to see the wide range and diversity of the institutions that we have and the ways that we serve students. Great. I know it's, it is, um, there's an energy to that. So talk to us a little bit. So at various times of year, you get different types of questions from academic leaders and different things that they want to talk about in terms of you know, what's going on at school. Can you tell us a little bit about the insights that you get then for the types of problem solving that those folks are facing? So um, the two things that really strike me is that school cultures are both more unique and more uh, similar than people expect. And so what that means is that people come to us with, this, with similar problems all the time. Um, so for example, um, I will talk to a school that's launching um, a high school division, um, for example, on the West Coast. And three days later, I might talk to one that's doing it on the East Coast. Um, and so they're dealing with the same kind of challenges and the same kind of strategic goals, um, but they're approaching them in very different ways based on their culture and their community. So we help solve problems around staffing. We help solve problems around scheduling. We help schools diversify their course offerings um, and we help them meet their strategic goals. Great, thank you. So what's the main challenge in August when you're talking with an academic leader? What are, what are the challenges that you're helping them with? Staffing and scheduling. <laughs> Could you see that? That was <laughs> quick. <laughs> you came right out with that. Yeah. Um, but that's because that's, that's really what, what we're doing this time of year is that we're helping, you know, in the spring, our work with schools is strategic. And in the fall, it's very targeted. It's targeted to what specifically is happening and how we can step into a situation and make it easier for a school to do what they're trying to do. You know what, that makes a ton of sense because nobody's spontaneously starting a high school in August. Well, probably not. And at least, you know, that's not coming as a surprise, but the the fact that the conversations change. So let's take one of those at a time. Let's tell, tell us about scheduling challenges. How should an academic leader approach considering online classes as, solu as a solution for scheduling challenges? Sure. Um, so this is something we often hear a lot about from smaller schools and something that we often hear about from students who are older, so 11th and 12th graders. Um, because as students get more clear on what their passions are, um, they really zero in on the courses they want. And they are more electives. And that means that there are more singleton sections. So the classic example that I give is the student who is ready for calculus BC and also really, really, really wants to take um, their school's anatomy course. And they meet at the same time. And so if you're just dealing with your physical plant and your full-time staff, then you have to ask the student to make a choice. Um, and you know that for students, that is an extremely high stakes decision. You know, when you're looking at the schedule and you're building that schedule, you know, you're doing that three-dimensional chess and you know, you're doing the best that you can for as many people as you can. That's the big picture. But when it comes down to scheduling, it's the small picture and that one student, for that one student, it's not a big deal for the schedule writ large, but it is everything to the student because the schedule is their promise for the kind of year that they want to have. So if you can say to the student, you know, 
we can get you both of these things. You're going to have to do one in a slightly different way than you expected or in a slightly different context or on a different platform than you expected, but we can give you the academic experience that you want. It's a win for everybody. So that's, that's the small picture of what we do. So I really like the way you described how fraught this is. I happen to be the parent of two high school seniors. And yes, I get that um, fraught with tension at home. So Beta, all right, the school has made the decision. When you think about students who are taking an online course due to the scheduling challenges, what strategies do you advise our teachers and, and the school's academic leaders at, when you think about support? Yeah. Uh, so once a student has come around to the idea that in order to get what they really want, they're going to have to take one of their courses online. Now, we're already working with those schools so that there, there is an um, alignment between what we do at One Schoolhouse and the strategies and the mission of the school that the student is coming from. So we know academic rigor, quality, all of those is going to be consistent. Um, but ultimately, this is often an incredibly positive experience. You know, I, I can only think about positive examples right now. Um, as, as a teacher who with One Schoolhouse for seven years teaching forensics, AP environmental, and AP psychology at One Schoolhouse, I have seen students come into my class um, for a variety of reasons. Oftentimes it is a scheduling um, a com component of, of getting them into the class. But we are we set them up with the skills that they need and the resources they need from the get-go and so if if they and their school have kind of prepared them on their end to say yep it's going to be a little bit different but one school house has everything that you need they're off and they're running and it's a really great success we have a full week orientation built into our classes and that helps tremendously it helps me when I was a teacher at one schoolhouse really get to know my students and my students to get to know me and all of a sudden they see oh this is a little bit different but I still get to explore the things that I am really interested in and it's going to be a really positive year and you know I I can really only think of positive examples from that yeah there's a word that I love nervous sighted right Kids might be a little bit nervous about changing the format, maybe less so this year, maybe more so, who knows. Um, but they're excited and they're getting to do what they want. So that's awesome, right? They're getting that AP psychology class and the class that it conflicts with. And they're getting an amazing independent school teacher. So Liz, the other challenge you cited as the most common is staffing challenges. So tell us a little bit more about that. So right now, this year is a little, a little bit different. Um, I think we're going to keep saying that. But if you've been reading um, in the newspapers um, or uh, listening online or on radio, um, that we're seeing what you know folks are calling the big quit or the uh, there's another one, but I'm going to I'm forgetting the great um, the great resignation. That's the other one that I'm hearing, um, which is that some folks have realized that they are just at the limit of what they can do and that they need to step away. Um, you know, in any profession that's hard, but it's especially hard given the way that the school calendar works and for independent schools, specifically the way that the hiring season works. So we are seeing um, more late season staffing adjustments that we're used to. If, uh, if you joined us a few weeks ago, you saw that we uh, one of our Pulse surveys was asking academic leaders how many faculty departures they'd had just over the summer months. We were shocked that 40% of our respondents told us they'd had four or more faculty departures over the summer. Um, and so schools, um, schools are scrambling and they're trying to figure out how they handle these situations. Right, and so when um, an academic leader starts looking at an unexpected departure and starts thinking about all of their options, certainly there's the late season hire, depending on where you live, it might be, you know, today might be the first day of school or you could be pretty close or maybe you've got a few more weeks. Um, there's also coverage, right? Asking teachers to do more who have already been asked to do more for so, so long. So what factors do you like for an academic leader to consider when they're thinking about the role of online learning? Sure. So, you know, when 
let me give, give this example. When a school calls us, we talk through a lot of things. You know, it's our first thing is never, yep, absolutely, we can do that, sign them up. It's, we always want it to be a conversation um, because what we know from our years of experience is that, that communication is that making sure everybody's on the same page about what we do and what schools are looking for is essential. And I'll be honest, sometimes we have these conversations and we say really directly, you know what, I hear what you're looking for that makes total sense and that's not, that's not what we do. And, you know, I'm sorry, we can't help out. And we find that quite frankly, being really straightforward with folks makes a huge difference. Um, we are trying to give students in our courses fantastic experiences. And if we don't have the preconditions for that, we don't, we don't want kids to have a negative experience. We want them to have a great academic year. So the conversation that we have is really about making sure that we're all on the same page about what a great academic year is. So the first question is, is the course you're looking to move online aligned with the courses that we offer? You know, nobody is gonna start building a course from scratch three weeks before the school year and have it be a good course. So, you know, or you might have a course that's slightly different. You might offer an anatomy and physiology course and we might offer an anatomy and kinesthesiology course, for example. You know, it, it, are those, is taking our course going to deliver the experience that these students want to have? So that's a question. Um, and then the school is always asking the question, do we try to hire for this position? Um, and they're balancing a lot of things there. Um, and this is one of those things where say schools are more, you know, really this has to do with where you are, what your community is like, and honestly, what the available pool looks like. There are some positions that are just hard to hire for as independent mm -hmm. schools. Um, the classic example that we give is um, computer science where folks have many, many options in the for-profit world, um, many of which, quite frankly, pay more than schools do. Um, and so those are hard positions to fill, even when you're doing that in March. Um, right. Sometimes you're asking, you know, is there the time for a search, right? If, if school is starting in five days, you want to know what the plan is in place. Um, and you also want to think about what you have the capacity to do as a faculty. Um, if you're, if you need a new uh, history teacher and your social studies department already has three new teachers coming in um, and they're all young and you know that onboarding is going to be pretty intensive for that department, you may not want to bring somebody else in to add to that load for your instructional designer or department chair. Um, and Teachers online are experienced. We've trained them. We take them through, we supervise their courses. So that takes it off not only the staffing requirements, but also the supervisory and evaluative uh, concept too. So Bliss, it sounds to me like a conversation with you, if I'm an academic leader in a school and I've had something um, unexpected happen with that, and I want you to tell me what to do, you're not going to do it, but you're going to help ask me the right questions so that I can go back to my team and say, you know, we have these three options and here are some questions we have to answer internally. Yep. I think that's, that's exactly it. Um, and you also want to think about the, the students in the course um, that, that a late breaking change for whatever reason does have an impact on students and has an impact on how they approach the course. Um, and so you want to think about your community also and how you are going to message a change out. And those are all things we help schools do. We don't say figure them out yourself. We have materials and we put together presentations and we help schools craft language. Um, so we're really experienced in helping schools through the transition, um, in helping students and families understand why they've made the change they did, what what they can feel confident about and also get them answers to questions that they might have. Right, and we've got a question in the Q&A and I'm welcoming everybody to include a question in the Q&A, but I think this is the right time for this. Um, could you talk a little bit about your advice to parents when they're thinking about, or your advice to schools on working with parents on thinking about, you know, this past year specifically, and that parents might really have some strong feelings about learning online. And how are you advising schools to answer those? Um, Beta, can I start with this one? 
Go for it, Liz. <laughs> so, and I say this also as an independent school parent, um, like Sarah, I have twins, um, but mine are sixth graders. Um, and so it's really important to differentiate between where we were last fall, which was crisis distance learning. We were all trying to figure out how do we move an experience that's built for being in person online um, for, uh, you know, with um, teachers whose primary modality is in person. So you're dealing with amazing teachers, but it's kind of like we ask them to um, suddenly do yoga in a swimming pool instead of on a mat, right? Um, it doesn't, it, there are lots of things that don't translate comfortably. So what we do in these situations is we make it really clear about how building a course for online instruction and training a teacher for online instruction is really different. Um, we hire in March, uh, just like other folks do, February and March, actually. We train our teachers for months before they build or revise courses. And they go through that entire build and revision process before they start working with students. So we're not jumping in at the deep end and figuring it out, which was the situation that so many people were in last fall and did with such grace and fortitude. Um, but having an experience that's built to be online is very different than having one that has to move online because of circumstances outside of people's control. Thank you. Um, so Beta, I wanna switch this just a little bit. And I know that you've already mentioned about our orientation. But when a school has a group of students who have had something, that, I mean, there may be mourning, there may be sadness. How do you help our teachers welcome those students to online learning? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. I, and I also think it's a little bit of a segue off of what Liz was just talking about with ensuring that both students and, and parents feel that we are providing um, the best support for the students possible. Um, and this is where, you know, I, Liz had mentioned, you know, we have almost 250 consortium schools, but we still truly stress the individualized and personalized attention for our students. So if there is a situation that perhaps was unexpected, um, this is where communication with uh, between us and our school partners is so vital because if we need to know something about a group of students, like perhaps, you know, wh why they're mourning or, or why there was a change in place, we wanna make sure that I can then relay this me these messages to to the teacher um, and make sure that the teacher is equipped to be as they normally would, warm, welcoming, <laughs> empathetic, but just know that there might be a little bit of uh, friction just at the start because a student isn't pursuing the course under the circumstances that, that they had originally planned on. And anything that, that comes in that, that's, that's uncomfortable, right? And that's a challenge. Right. So not only is the student going through that emotionally, but they're also trying to get a successful start off to their school year. So I work really closely with teachers in the mode of student support. So I help support teachers so that they can best support their students. And part of this does come down to, to really having our teachers get to know their students. And that starts immediately the moment course is open and teachers and students meet live. They talk about you know, who they are as learners, what goals they're trying to accomplish this year. And there are constant check-in points, reflection points. And that is, is what uh, grows the relationship between teacher and student. And if we, if I need to talk to a teacher about um, saying, you know, it might be a, a really great opportunity to ask this question in your opening video, I can reach out to the teacher and make sure that they incorporate that. And that helps and it makes the student feel really supported and also feel heard. Um, which is exactly what we want students to feel, especially in the midst of what, 18, almost 20 months of, of this uncertainty, um, knowing that there's gonna be more of it along the way, but, but we can create that structure and that platform to give students security. Yeah, it's so interesting to me when we think about sort of the vastness we talk about, we were talking with schools all over the country and all these things, but. But the student experience is so much smaller. It is that student and that teacher. I, I think that's something you manage really well. Sorry, 
I, I digress here for a minute. So, um, thank you. So I think I want to, the other, one of the things that I think about is I think about it being a lot like the difference between teaching a course that's required and an elective. So um, I was an English teacher in the classroom before, um, before I moved into uh, administrative roles. And there was a huge difference between the students who took just regular old English 10 and the students who showed up in my senior elective on American Lit, right? The kids who were in that senior course, they, were, they, they picked it, they were excited to be there, they wanted to be there, um, they had, they already were engaged because they'd made the choice and choice increases engagement. Um, and they already felt like they were among people who they had chosen to be with. The 10th graders who walk into my English 10 class, some of them are really excited to be there. And some of them are like, this is not my thing. Um, and that's exactly what happens when a course, um, when a course switches to an online modality unexpected. Some kids are like, hey, this is cool. Um, and some kids are like, this is where I have to be right now, fine. Um, so, you know, it's just like we work with that same range of kids and expectations um, coming into our classrooms when we're in buildings, we do the same thing online. Um, and so, for example, I'm sure we have all been in schools where for some reason you have a mid-year switch. Um, sometimes it's, you know, exciting. A, uh, somebody's out on parental leave and everybody's really happy. And sometimes it's really hard. Um, uh, two years ago, we had a teacher unexpectedly pass away in January. And so those students had to switch teachers. And so in the same way that students respond to change and, um, and to respond to change being out of their control differently in the classroom, the same thing happens online. Online, we have to be really attentive to it. It's one of the things that we know because, and everybody knows this now, when you're not in the same space, you have really different data points about how you learn about your students. Mm -hmm. And coming online, you have to be really intentional about building that relationship because things like body language and where kids sit and how and who raises their hand first, all of those things aren't your data points anymore. So what we've learned is that we build intentionally for connection and we, we build intentionally understanding that kids are coming in in a range of places. Um, and so we're always primed to do that because we know that experiencing change is really complicated for adolescents. Some are really resilient and flexible. Some are really rigid and resistant. And we're ready to work with all of those. And we're ready also to help explain to schools what we see and what they can expect to see so that we give students the best experience they can have. I really like the way that you, you wrap that up because I think that's gonna be super important for those students who are coming online with us for their first semester because it's not yet comfortable for their families to send them to school. And even a student who understands and welcomes that is gonna be wishing maybe that they were, were in school or maybe they're, you know, they won't be, but that we're really ready for them if they're having that experience. Before we wrap up, I've got a couple of questions. One is, Liz, I want you to address something that you talked about when we were planning for this, which is communicating too fast, that there are some pitfalls there. And so what advice do you have for school leaders about how they communicate with families when they've made the shift? So the first thing we say is um, take a moment to make sure you have all the information. When you communicate out a change, and this is whether it's about moving a class online or whether it's about a staffing change within your own faculty or whether it's about a new protocol, that um, sometimes a holding statement like, hey, we want to let you know that a change is happening. We're going to tell you more later. Sometimes that's great. And sometimes it works really well. And sometimes it raises anxiety. And so if you have the ability to wait a few days to get your communication clear um, and to help people and to envision the transition, not just that a change will happen, but how the change will happen. It is always more useful if, if you have the luxury 
And in these days, we know it's a luxury. But if you have that luxury to be able to communicate, not just that there will be a change, but how you will make it to that change and how you will help people feel confident about the change. Right. Such a great point. Um, Beta and Liz, it's, it's time. We're at the end, but I just want to thank both of you so much for coming and joining me today. I really appreciate this. And if you are watching the recording of this, please look underneath the recording for some helpful links. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah.